hello! Oh, I didn't see you there. Go ahead, take a seat. I'm Lincoln Perkins Claus. Uh, Perch and the boys let me stay in the primetime den until my brother-in-law Santa gets done with my part of the, the North Pole. That way I can use my consignment shop again. But as penance for letting me stay here, I agreed to do their intro for them. Firstly, Rostermania doesn't stop, not even for the holidays. And then we take a sleigh ride around the league to figure out all the good news that's out there for you boys and girls. And then finally, Riot's gifting you a new champion this month for Christmas. Ho ho! Now, this isn't my usual setup, but since the boys are so nice and I'll be here for a while, you may just see me again for this holiday season. Well, anyways, this is Lincoln Perkins Claus, and this is also Primetime Esports. Welcome back to another episode of Primetime Esports. We have a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Roster Mania never rests, not even for the holidays, and there's plenty of spicy content out there right now. We're going to go region by region and give you all the latest going on right now around the league. In North America, not too many roster shuffles going on among the minor teams, but the one major roster fiesta is within the Immortals organization. It appears that the rumors are at least partially true, as Rainover has left the team to join Team Liquid to replace Dardock. Rainover posted a 76% win rate with the Immortals during the 2016 summer split. He also had a 5.5 KDA with an average goal difference of 215 in the team's summer campaign. Immortal support Adrian has also left the team, signing a new contract with Phoenix One after Phoenix support Gate and top laner Brandini declared free agency. Adrian posted an impressive kill participation average of 73% as well as a KDA of 4.75 and a total average of 1.75 wards per minute. Now gentlemen, we're going to go right into this rainover thing, which it wasn't, it was kind of rumored, not really surprising though. Uh, where does TL sit now in the preseason rankings now they've gotten this acquisition? Well, I think so far the pieces that they have look really good uh, with Lorlo, Rainover, and uh, Matt. I think that the two main questions will be on their bot lane and how that bot lane plays. I think the AD carry that they choose to go with is really going to help shape that team a lot. And then back to going to with back to Matt, um, I think that Matt's consistency is really going to be the big question this year. As we saw uh, in their documentary, he himself said it, uh, his consistency is the biggest key to their success. I think that, uh, I think that Rainover is going to bring a lot of solidarity to the team, a lot of teamwork, um, ability to like, coordinate these guys. That's the problem that TL has had for a long time, is that they have like, individually skilled players, but they're not able to consolidate that into a functioning team that really works well together. So. Um, I really look forward to seeing them uh, work together this upcoming season and seeing how they shape up. Yeah, and personally, I think that Rainover is a better decision because he did more with less. He had an average 2.15 CS difference at 10 minutes, which was a complete flip from Dardock's negative 2.15. But speaking of Dardock, let's go on to the next question. Where does Dardock go from here? He's not with Echo Fox right now. He's kind of, he, I don't want to say free agent, but he has not declared where he's actually going. Where do you think is his next uh, destination? I think it's definitely going to be one of the mid to bottom table teams in the NALCS. Uh, I, he's too good for Challenger, and I don't see him leaving North America. Um, and I also don't see any of the top tier teams really having a need for him right now. A lot of the top tier teams. TSM, CLG, Cloud9, they're all set with their junglers. So I, I'm expecting it to be someone like an Echo Fox, uh, maybe like uh, E United. I mean, not, not E United themselves, but a lower table team. Yeah, I personally think it's actually really interesting about Dardock because I was really excited to see where he was going to end up, especially after TL's uh, documentary. He seemed like a player that's like, has a really good work ethic and he's pretty valuable because he doesn't take an import slot. That being said, there were rumors that he was going to join Echo Fox earlier in the season with him changing his Twitter handle and also um, the team somewhat announcing it. Then there were quick retractions um, and it turns out later that Santorin was signed as the jungler for Echo Fox. So only time will tell for Dardock, but I, I hope he has a good opportunity ahead of him. 
and now back to Immortals. We know that the rest of their lineup, it's basically been set in stone. Immortals did come out with a letter saying that the rest of the lineup has left the team. Where does Immortals go from here? They went from top of the table to now they have nothing. And how, how great is, is the organization in jeopardy right now? How big are they at risk? I, do you want to go ahead? Um, well, I was just going to say, like, thinking back on it, I know there were rumors earlier, maybe a week or so ago, that uh, Immortals could possibly pick up Bing, Bengi and Duke, uh, formerly SKT members, but I'm not sure how much they really hold weight because later on on the Immortals Twitter account, they sort of jested about, you know, oh wow, we're going to pick up Duke and Bengi, and we didn't even know about it. Apparently, the community's detective work is so great that uh, they know before the actual team does. So we'll see how that shapes up for them. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is a really serious situation for Immortals to be in right now um, because looking at the talent that's left on the table, there really aren't that many players to be that are up in the air um, that could be possible fits. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them fill up on uh, challenger talent and they're definitely going to have to make use of those import slots. Maybe some of the talent that we saw at the NA scouting grounds might find their way onto that team. Now on to Adrian. Going to P1, uh, what does he bring to that team? So I think Adrian's main uh, quality is stability. Um, I think that he brings this sort of like good peeling uh, style supports. He's great on supports like Janna, Soraka, Tarek, um, and Nami and Karma. But other than that, I really don't see much versatility from him. So I think his main strength is that he's able to highlight his high skilled teammates and ag aggressive players, which really works when you play on a team with Huni and Wild Turtle. But uh, when you play on a team with players that aren't able to just purely mechanically beat their opponents, uh, I, I don't think you'll see as much success from him. Yeah, as far as Adrian's considered, um, I'm not quite sure uh, where he's going to fit. A lot of people were questioning his work ethic as a player. There were rumors that he was you know, smoking pot before the CLG game uh, last split. Um, so a lot of criticism from the community recently. I don't necessarily think it's that critical when it comes to a uh, team's assessment of whether they want a player or not. Uh, he'll find a team, though. I believe that you know being on a top team definitely helped him fill out his resume, so to speak, um, as far as viability to a lot of teams. And he's an overall stable pick, in my mind. Now, the question is, will he actually find success with this roster? Like, does he bring enough to like push them over the top because we know at the end of the year Phoenix one actually looked pretty good with Inori they made a run at the end of the year to stay in the LCS but does he bring them to at least a, a top of the table fifth or sixth place team no he doesn't <laughs> like I said he, he just he's good at uh, creating he's not good at creating space he's good at helping other people do that and I don't think that the rest of the talent on Phoenix one is good enough uh, to push them to above a six seed at best. I mean, I don't, I don't even think they'll be top six again. I have some faith in them. I don't know. I, I think that Anori could pop off for a season and you know go insane. Uh, I, as far as NA is considered, I just I think it's sort of closer, a little bit closer between the top and lower seed teams. Also, that being said, P1 looked pretty solid near the end of the season, like you were mentioning, Andy. Um, but with Adrian, you know, maybe they could, maybe that could be the tipping point for them and uh, take them into that area of success. So we'll see. Interesting. Now, moving on to the next region, in Europe, a lot less shifting and a lot more cementing of lineups as many European teams are focusing on keeping the players they already have. Splice have re signed their entire 2016 roster, including their coach, Tomato Canyon. That's Yamato Canyon for those of you that don't know and Splice ended the year with an unprecedented dominance of the summer split in a trip to the World Championships. The team looks to continue their domination of the European scene in 2017, but moving on to Eurocomers of Love, they've re-signed their entire roster, but they did get rid of Move, and they did not renew his contract of the starting jungler. They have instead moved LCS player Cersei into the starting jungle position for the foreseeable future. Move posted a 2.8 KDA for the summer split with a 63.5 kill participation and a first blood percentage of 36%.
The squad posted poor numbers in the LCS summer split, but in typical Unicorns fashion, they were able to find their way into the playoffs. Now, lads, how important is it for Splice to re-sign their entire roster and have everyone come back? It was looking pretty worrying there for a second. We didn't know Wonder and Sinkux decided to test the free agency waters, but they decided to come back home. Where does this team now line up in European power rankings with all the rest of the roster shuffles going on? I think it's going to be a similar scenario to um, last year during the summer split when the teams were kind of a mess because of all of the shifting of players and like moving of positions and such. I think that it actually is a good sign for Splice to re-sign their roster. They performed pretty well at Worlds given the tier of the teams that they had in their group. I believe they were in a group with TSM, um, Royal Never Give Up, and Samsung. So their group was pretty stacked in comparison uh, to the other squads. They did very well, and I'd like to see how much they improve this split. I think one big thing that we could take away from Worlds for Splice is how young they really are and how inexperienced they are. I mean, they went from Challenger to Worlds in a year. That's like a TV show title. But um, I think that coming off that Worlds experience, really learning a lot about themselves and how uh, the higher tier teams work, um, I think that they'll be able to take that and apply that to their raw talent that they have in guys like Wonder, Sinkooks, and Trashy, who are all incredible players. And I actually think Splice will be a top two team in uh, EU LCS bowl splits. Uh, now we're going to move on to UOL as well. They've re-signed their entire roster. But guys, my real question is, is it a bit too soon? I, we know we won the IM Oakland, but is IM Oakland a legit enough test for them to actually re-sign their entire roster save move? Well, I don't think that IM Oakland specifically was the reason that they chose to re-sign because no, that isn't enough. Uh, it was on a previous patch, and it really didn't mean that much whether you won or lost. Um, but I do think that the re-signing this roster is good. You have players like Vizachachi in particular, who last summer split was fourth in gold share and yet was first in damage per minute and first in CS difference. Um, so you have this guy who does a lot with very little. And uh, they have players like that all across the board, a solid team that works well with good cohesion. I think that uh, if they give this roster some time, they can definitely perform at a high level uh, next split. Yeah, UL is sort of a predicament for me. I, I feel like the team did pretty solidly perform at IEM. Uh, that being said, I, I agree with Andy. have to agree that IEM is definitely not a gauge of skill in any way for these teams. A lot of these teams treat IEM as sort of like an off-season uh, type of competition. The fact that the LCS um, treats that period of time where IEM has their competition as off-season doesn't really bode well for the competition there uh, because the teams are not scrimming specifically and training very hard for IEM. So with that being said, uh, we'll, we'll see how UL does during the season um, to sort of gauge like how their performance is going and, and such. So. And I want to add one more thing. I think that the fact that it was on the Worlds patch also detracted from the amount of interest that there was from fans and from players on, uh, at IEM Oakland. I think that had they done it on the new preseason patch and said, let's see what these new players can do, I think that the tournament would have been taken a lot more seriously by the fans and the players. Exactly. I, I am not really known for being the uh, greatest organizers of tournaments, but really, like guys, should they have at least considered any other options before re-signing their entire roster, especially like options except for Move, because Move actually performed, I won't say like he was a top jungler, but he did perform adequately for the team, seeing as he just joined the team that year, and the rest of the team has been together for a while now, and this is the ninth jungle they brought in uh, throughout all of 2016. I think what's mostly important when you're on a professional team is who fits best with your roster. And I think, as you just mentioned, they're really struggling to find who that is. And so um, when, they're, when, when you're looking for these new players, you know, it's not always who's mechanically best, but who's the best mechanical player that also fits with our team. Mm -hmm. And it's also a question of like who is available because the communi community can speculate a lot on sort of like who is going to be available to sign and who is, you know, melds with the team well, but there's no way to actually know. That's all really sort of behind the scenes stuff with the team and the coaching staff to find out who can sort of really gel with the team and create a good environment. 
Moving on to another team who's actually been having a lot more shifts, H2K is the last team to make recent roster moves. They renewed the contracts of their star Polish duo Vander and Jankos for the 2017 season, while a recent report has stated that Febovin has been signed to replace Ryu as a team starting mid laner. Both Jankos and Vander were instrumental in the team's success in the LCS and international play. Jankos, known as the First Blood King, posted an outstanding 53% First Blood average on the year, as well as an average 5.3 KDA and 81% kill participation rate during the regular season. That damage per minute wasn't bad also. His counterpart Jankos, uh, his counterpart Vander, I mean, posted numbers just as impressive in the year with an average KDA of 5.6, higher than many of his EU support counterparts, while only having a 17% share of his team's deaths. Febovin had what can only be described as a frustrating season last split with Fnatic. While with Fnatic, Febovin posted a 2.35 KDA on the year, as well as a 23.6% damage share. Fnatic went 20 and 17 for the split. The team's backup AD carry, Freeze, has decided to leave the team and is fielding offers. Now for this team, guys, how big is it that they signed Febovin for their team? I mean, his numbers weren't that good this last split, but he still was a rock for that Fnatic squad. Yeah, I, I feel, you know, initially a lot of people were like, okay, Febovin, that's kind of like a weird signing. You didn't really expect him to leave uh, Fnatic or sort of, you know, get kicked from the team. But that being said, he did have a very, very rough season uh, former, formerly. In the summer split, he had a 54% win rate, which was about his highest statistic being fourth out of the league's mid laners. His kill participation was 67.7%, that's seventh place. There were only three AD carries lower, or mid laners lower than him out of the entire European League. And then his CS differential at 10 minutes was two, negative 2.6. He was the last place mid laner to actually have a CS difference that was in the negative numbers at 10 minutes. What that shows to me, at, and definitely to Fnatic, is that as an early game performer, he had really low impact on Fnatic last season, and hopefully we'll be able to step it up on H2K, uh, seeing as that was his former squad before Fnatic. See, I actually think uh, the opposite, because when you take statistics like that, it's easy to look at it at face value and just say, okay, so he's underperforming because he's got a low CSD and you know low damage per minute and all this other stuff. Um, but it is easier to look good on a better team. Now, I'm not using that to justify uh, Febivin's performance. I do think that he definitely has areas where he could improve on, but I think that when you look at statistics like those, um, I think that it's important to remember that Fnatic was a weak team as a whole, last, uh, the last two splits, really, and um, things that they might do. Like, if you're playing, if you're picking matchups that go late, or uh, losing matchups in lane, but it's best for the team, uh, those numbers might get skewed against him in his favor. And 20 and 17 is still better than a lot of the teams in the EU, and uh, some of that can be contributed to Febovin, but the next question is, how crucial is it for HK to re-sign their Polish duo Yander, Jankos and Vander? Both these players are kind of the core of the team, and especially knowing that Freeze and Forgiven are up for free agency and might not re-sign, this is pretty big for them. Yeah, I think this is massive. I mean, Jankos and Vander are definitely the two most consistent players on H2K. I mean, as you stated, uh, Jankos with that over 50% first blood participation throughout the year at Worlds, 62% in 13 games with a 5 KDA, uh, second only to Bengi and Peanut, who, guess what, were in the finals and semifinals of the tournament. So yeah. that's pretty good. And then Vander, with the third lowest death percentage in the tournament, the, a 5.4 KDA and double the next highest goal difference at 10 minutes for support, which means that in lane, he is finding ways to earn gold in other ways that other supports cannot. So Vander and Yankos, definitely two pieces of H2K that you just cannot uh, go without. Yeah, Van Vander, well, actually, Yankos' performance, especially leading up to Worlds and going into Worlds, um, actually, in including his performance at Worlds, he is one of the top performing junglers, and he was all over the map. Some ridiculous um, first blood participation in not only Worlds, but the patch leading up to Worlds and playoffs as well. Uh, Yankos is definitely contention for one of the best junglers at Worlds, if not the best, um, including, 
you know, other junglers such as Peanut um, can be up there for consideration as well. Uh, so I definitely think those two are core elements to H2K, and it's good for the team that they're staying. They need a sort of core foundation to uh, build a new team around. Well, very good insights, gentlemen. But moving on to Korea, where some extremely big news has been brewing for some time. And we've had bits and pieces trickling in steadily, but it is now official. The Rocks Tigers are done. Prey, Kuro, and Gorilla already announced that they were seeking other options. Smeb is head to KT, while Peanut will be signing with the world champions SKT for the 2017 season. Despite their domestic and international success, the Rocks Tigers were plagued by financial issues as they could not find any major sponsors to back their team. The team posted a 67.5 win rate throughout the year domestically, while at Worlds the numbers were equally impressive, posting a 62.5 win percentage and first blood rate. The team fell short to SKT in the finals. Now guys, there's a lot of big talent out there now. Like, we know that Smeb and Peanut are already gone, but now you still have Prey, Gorilla, and Kuro just waiting in the wings for some team to pick it up. And there are a lot of teams that now have empty rosters. CJ dropped their entire roster. Jen Air dropped their entire roster. Where do you think that Prey and Gorilla and uh, Kuro go? I know also I believe that they were saying they might uh, consider international options as well. It's looking increasingly more likely that they go international. Um, Jen Air is possible, like what you were saying, that they emptied their roster. Uh, CJ, I've heard rumors that they are not actually looking to field a league team any longer um, in LCK. So we'll see where a lot of those players end up. They could end up in China, they could end up in NA, um, or even Europe. So, uh, My guess is that Jin Air will get at least one of those guys. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Prey and Gorilla stick together, but that all depends on how this KT fiasco goes through. Because it looks like KT's first priority is getting Mata for their bot lane to match up with Deft. But if that's not possible, definitely looking like they, the next best fit would be Gorilla. Um, and then in regards to Kuro and Prey, I mean, they're both incredible players. Prey especially, one of the best players at Worlds for his position. Um, so I would not be surprised to see him go to China and either like cash out or uh, find his way onto a team and become a leader in the LCK. Another important question that you have to ask is, will you see other team models like this where, you know, players come together... They might find a little bit of sponsorship money to kind of stick together for an entire season, try and do something, and try and up their stock, as it were, so they can find higher teams. Because before Rocks, uh, everyone thought Prey was on his way out the door. Um, I believe Gorilla, everyone thought he was on his way out the door as well. And Kuro was kind of an unknown factor, as well as Peanut and Smeb. This could be a model we see in the future in uh, a region that is known for, you know, CJ dropping out as soon as they get out, you know, things like that. Well, I think it's unlikely that we'll see players who are on their last leg, so to speak, and uh, join a super team that is a team like Rocks and succeed as well as they did. I think that that individually is not very likely, but I do think that there will be players who... Maybe they're looking to revitalize their careers. They'll go join a team specifically that will benefit them in their best interests. And before my mom, but I just want to say a, a question. You said a super team, but remember before they actually started the roll down, no one thought that the Rocks was a super team. They looked at it as more team that was made together from a bunch of veterans and nobodies that were just having fun, and then they became that super team. But I wouldn't say as far as they started off as a super team. No, for sure. I, I agree with that. I would just say that I wouldn't expect teams to experience their degree of success. You mentioned upping their stock. Uh, I don't expect players to be able to just go join a team with guys that they like playing with and then all of a sudden find themselves in the semifinals of the world championship. Yeah. I don't see that. Um, but I do see team uh, players such as themselves joining teams maybe to up their individual stock, but not a team as a whole. Yeah, I, I feel, I mean, of course what Rocks had was a, a really sort of rare success story in that they were able to come together as a group of players who weren't regarded as the top in their positions um, and create something that was really unique and really a threat to the LCK as a whole. Um, a very good performing team, not only were they 
uh, professional teammates with each other. They were also very close. They had a close relationship, like a family, is what a lot of the players said. Um, so, you know, looking forward to seeing sort of like, is a squad going to come up that matches that level of performance? It's another thing that, I mean, I've said it before, I'll say it again, that time will only tell what, whether these teams are able to meld together. You see a lot of superstars like, you know, Mata, Deft, players coming back to the LCK. Are they going to be able to not only meld into a team, but perform at the level that we expect of them? Now, another large shakeup that also happened, but this time to the KT organization, as four of the five players on their roster, starting roster left the team. But since then, the team has only signed nothing but superstars in Dev, Smeb, Han, and Mata. While scorers we signed earlier this week, the team ended their last season 29 and 15, and were finally able to defeat SKT 1 and 19 in that series in the playoffs before falling to the Tigers in the summer finals. They then went on to lose to Samsung in the regional qualifier tournament finals. Now, uh, this team, my gosh. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, KT, when I saw these signings initially, I was thinking like, okay, the team is definitely like really pissed off that they weren't <laughs> able to make it into Worlds because they really like, they got knocked out by Samsung. So. You know, tr the traditional and favorite pick for getting the third was KT. A lot of fans are behind KT. A lot of supporters expected them to do well. And when they didn't make it to that sort of world's finale for them, um, it was a huge disappointment. And I can't imagine the organization was pleased either. That's why you see a lot of these roster signings. You see superstar players, massive salary players being signed to KT. Yeah, I, I mean, anyone who says that anyone other than KT is the winner of this offseason is lying to themselves. Uh, they signed four of the highest profile players in the world and it's looking like Mata or uh, Gorilla, as we said earlier, which are arguably one and two best supports in the world. So uh, I, I think that this team is going to be a lot of fun to watch. I'm interested to see how they play together um, and I hope that the meta favors aggressive, explosive play, because I think that they will be able to see a lot of that from them. But the real question is, is this the team that can release us from the, well, I call it joy, you call it a nightmare, SKT skins, uh, permanent, eternal reign? Can they really do it? Can they beat SKT? I know they have a good shot, but can they actually fulfill it? Only time will tell, because uh, on paper, it looks like they can match up with them. But uh, as we all know, one of the things that makes SKT so damn impossible to beat is their uh, diversity of play style, how good they are as a, as a unit. And I think that uh, hopefully over time, KT will be able to build that and uh, be able to contend with SKT for those skins. I hope so as well. I mean, the thing about SKT is they haven't kept the same roster, you know, going from season to season. And they certainly have been, haven't been fielding the same players even within the same season. They have sub, uh, well, they had a sub jungler, um, which it's up for debate whether they still will or not. Uh, but the team has shown that, that the players are not the key to their success, necessarily. They can field uh, a different roster going game to game and still see the success that they've seen cons consistently. So, you know, a lot of people have said this, and I sort of back up the statement that, you know, have faith in coma sort of <laughs> mentality where. You'll pick up players, um, the team will pick up the players which will fit them best. And I personally hope to see a close rivalry between KT and SKT. We need to see some teams sort of, you know, clawing for the top spot. So. All right, I'm looking forward to it. But now that we're done with the recent roster mania, it's time to move on to the news that's happening around the league. First, I am Oakland came and went over Thanksgiving week. And although we know the Unicorns of Love won the tournament, more notably is the fact that the competition was the first legal esports betting ground in League of Legends history. The Nevada Gaming Control Board approved permission for one of Nevada's most popular sports betting enterprises, William Hill Sportsbook at Downtown Grand, to take bets on the tournament. Nevada Governor Brian Sandoval said in a statement that this announcement is a major step toward ensuring Nevada becomes the esports capital of the world. What path, this is uh, unprecedented. I mean, when I first saw this news, it kind of like shocked me because 
esports betting in league has almost been a no non factor. What does this change about league? What is this? What path does this put league for think, its future? I think this is a great thing for league long term because. As we experienced with CSGO and the whole skins betting thing, mm -hmm. one of the main reasons that that is so important is because it increases fan interest in lower tier games. Like, let's be honest, there's not many people that really care about Giants vs. Rocket right now. But going forward, when you put bets on it, it makes it more interesting for you individually. You're invested in that game, and that's really what makes the LCS game so interesting, is either you're watching great League of Legends, or you're watching a team that you really care about. Um, and so when you have these lower tier teams that really aren't uh, as exciting to watch, aren't really playing the game as an equally high level as the other teams, um, betting definitely gives you that emotional sense of like, oh, I really want Rocket to win this game, like I bet $50 on them. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say the most important aspect, at least in my, you know, my opinion, um, is that the Nevada sort of like Nevada sort of nodding at esports and saying yeah we want it to be we want this to be like the hub of esports um, betting sort of brings a lot of um, legitimacy to the league and a lot of uh, sort of stability to esports as a betting ground you see you saw a lot of problems in the past year or so with uh, CSGO and like uh, knife betting and all of that stuff or knife sale where it was really not legitimized on a on a professional level, so you saw a lot of like websites and sort of um, other shady enterprises prop up and sort of really disservice that industry. So I feel, you know, it's definitely a good thing for esports as a whole. Good, good. Now on the topic of money, it was rumored that Riot was in talks with MLB Advanced Media, a limited partnership of the club owners of Major League Baseball. And a report has confirmed that Riot will sell the LCS streaming rights to MLB AM for $200 million. This is a big stride for Riot, as many would have never thought that Riot had ideas of selling any rights to its broadcasting systems anytime in the present. Now, guys, what took them so long to do this? I don't know. Riot likes to wait for the community or for people to throw things at them until they're about to break the door down and then Riot says, surprise, we had this planned all along. So, uh, I mean, I think this is a great thing for esports. I think ex uh, not just League of Legends, but other games expanding into other uh, major broadcasting areas will only help it grow. Um, and so I, I think that this is a great move that should have happened a while ago. Yeah, it's... Sort of when the news broke out, especially on Reddit, a lot of people were sort of raising uh, red flags saying, you know, oh, well, this could mean like a really sort of bad thing for League Esports as a whole. They're selling out. They're not like, you know, they're not doing what's in the best interest for the community, which I, I sort of really disagree with. I mean, the, if you look at the contract itself between MLB AM and Riot, it is purely a streaming and broadcasting contract. And I think one of the better things that it brings to the industry is that MLB AM has a really professional streaming and sort of record keeping of, of MLB games. And if they transfer that to League of Legends, they'll have really legitimate record keeping of the games. Um, they have 162 games a year in MLB AM. Uh, that they record and keep documented. So if they did that for League of Legends, we're looking at better services for players overall to like see games and sort of be able to analyze them. And that's so. 162 games per team. Yeah. So Now, I'm going to ask this next question. It's going to be a simple yes or no from you guys, and this will affect me emotionally. My emotional state will be changed. Will we see other future streaming and broadcasting deals of bigger magnitude for the league? Yes. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Anyways, in other league news, two new teams have entered this challenger scene, while one other large organization is looking to find their way there as well. CLG and E United have both bought spots in the NA Challenger Series. While the challenger roster for CLG has been decided it will be four-fifths of Team Cloud, E United have already signed two noteworthy coaches in Broken Shard and Hermit. Temple Storm have also announced that they will field a team for the NA Challenger Series qualifier. The team previously attempted to buy their way into the LCS but dropped out of the running for a spot after team owner Raynaud cited a lack of funds 
We're looking at a resume for Broken Shard and Hermit right now. Hermit, as you all know, for those who don't know, coached the 2015 World Championship team and he also recently coached for Energy, while Broken Shard coached for the 2015 Dignitas Challenger team in Europe and Dream Team's Challenger squad as well. Guys, what's the reason for CLG kind of buying into the spot? We're seeing another C9 Challenger team where it's like, we're just buying it and then we're gonna sell it later once we win the league. Like, please, please tell me no. Well, the difference, okay. So the starting difference, and I think one of the most major aspects of this sort of CLG acquisition is that all of the players are fresh faces. Like none of them have been in the LCS before. Um, like what you were mentioning before, four out of the five players from the scouting grounds are on that team. So it's really interesting to see, and I really, um, I'm eager to see it be a success for CLG because if it is a success, that means better opportunities for challenger players, especially. It'll show the teams that it's not a liability to pick up a challenger squad for the Challenger series. So uh, that being said, it's interesting the choices that they made um, comparison, like in, in comparison to C9, where they just quickly, you know, sort of stomped Challenger series and sold their spot. So I think one important thing that Muhammad did say uh, and that I really agree with is the fact that it's four out of five of the members uh, from Scouting Grounds. And so I think what that does is that sets this precedent where. Uh, moving forward, if this team is able to do well, then it will make teams look at the Challenger Series as what it should be, which is sort of like a D-League or like a farm sy system, to where players can go there, they'll grow, learn how to play competitively, and uh, hopefully with some more funding from Riot, it won't be this huge economic risk to have a Challenger team that doesn't win. And how, what do you think of the chances that E United and Timbo Storm actually make it into the LCS? Now, in Europe, there seems to be more of a success rate of EU teams moving up to the LCS. What are the chances for these two new teams to make it in? Personally, I think E United has the better chance. Um, Broken Shard's been around since forever. I mean, he's been around since the beginning of League, basically. And he's been at a challenger slash high diamond level coaching on multiple different challenger teams and really showing that he understands this game well. I think he's gonna be a great fit. And then uh, Hermit, obviously, having c uh, experience coaching an LCS team, I think that he'll be able to really bring in some of that structure that teams uh, have struggled with, and um, hopefully we'll see good results from them. I hope so too. This is sort of a similar situation to what I saw last, well, what we all saw last season with NRG. Um, you never wanna see new investors coming into the industry and then getting bitten when their LCS team, you know, drops out of LCS and back into the Challenger series. It sort of really shies investors away from, from coming into the scene. So I hope for the success of these, of these teams to get into the LCS and then not only get in, but be able to stay in given uh, the performance of the team is sufficient. I hope so too. Now that's actually going to wrap it up for us today. I know it was a long one. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget that later this month, Camille the Steel Shadow will be released. From Primetime Sports, I'm Perch Perkins. Shout out to my Uncle Vaughn, first of all. And we will see you later.